Our two speakers today are Alyssa Ford Morrell and Carolyn Vincent. Alyssa is a transplanted Californian who moved to Virginia 22 years ago. After a 25 year career in charitable fundraising, she left that field in 2012, the same year she went through master gardener training. She now has her own small business as a domestic concierge and gardener. Alyssa has loved gardening since childhood and started propagating plants in high school. She is one of the coordinators of the Glen Carlin Library Garden. She is also a master naturalist and serves as an Audubon at home ambassador, helping people certify their yards as wildlife sanctuaries. Carolyn Vincent became a master gardener in 2010, and she loved gardening so much that she went back to school to learn more, receiving a master's degree in sustainable landscape design in 2018. She's previously worked for Murrayfield and the Yankee Clippers, and now is a designer at the King's Masons, where she's been for almost five years. She mostly does brick and stone work, and the heart and soul of her gardening activities is in her own yard. Thank you, Carolyn and Alyssa, for being with us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Carolyn Vincent. I'm delighted to be with you today. And uh, today we're going to be in storytelling mode. The understanding of how we reduce our lawns is still developing. So there's a lot of experimentation going on out there. And we have half a dozen master gardeners who are willing to tell their stories. We're going to be in tell-all mode. So what happened, what went well, what didn't work, and what would we do over again? Let's start off talking about why we might reduce lawn. It's a popular topic now. A lot of people are interested. A primary reason is that there is just so very much acreage across the country that's dedicated to growing lawn. And of course, that brings with it all of the maintenance with chemical controls that produce pollution. That problem is greatly exacerbated by there being so very much of it. Also, lawn is not a great place ecologically. It's been called an ecological dead space. And that problem, too, is greatly exacerbated because there is so very, very much acreage that's devoted to lawn across the country. So those are all some reasons why we would reduce. But let's take a minute and ask ourselves, why do we have this fixation with lawn anyway? Where does this come from? How have so many of us been persuaded that it's a great idea? Well, it did all start back in Europe in the 1700s and the 1800s when estate gardens had lawn type areas. Thomas Jefferson brought that to this country and had some lawn areas at Monticello. So there was a prestige factor initially associated with lawn areas that doesn't really totally explain why we have so much of it here, but then came Frederick Law Olmsted, who you've probably heard of. He's sometimes called the father of American landscape architecture. He is a legend. You probably know him as the designer of the Capitol grounds of Central Park. And he did design many public parks and parkways that featured trees and lawn areas. So he reinforced the aesthetic of land that's devoted to growing turf. However, it was Frank J. Scott who popularized lawn areas for the suburban gardener. And from a book by Michael Pollan, there's a chapter called Why Mo? I'm just going to read you an excerpt from Scott's book, which explains so very well our fixation on lawns. Scott's book probably did more than any other to determine the look of the American landscape. Like so many reformers of that time, Scott was nothing if not sure of himself. A smooth, closely shaven surface of grass is by far the most essential element of beauty on the grounds of a suburban house. Scott, like Olmsted before him, sought to elevate the unassuming patch of turf grass into an institution of democracy. In his most radical departure from old world lawn practices, he dwelled on the individual's responsibility to his neighbors. Those who would dissent from Olmsted's and Scott's plans were branded as selfish, unneighborly, unchristian, and undemocratic. So with cultural values that are that strong, it's no wonder 
that lawn is everywhere. Now, let's launch into my story. The stories are all a little bit different, yet we all have a lot in common. My theme is lawn as part of the garden. I am a lawn reducer, but yet I've kept some of my lawn. And I do value the part that I've kept because it's a part of my garden. One of my big ideas is probably all of you who have joined today are interested in lawn reduction, maybe thinking about uh, doing it yourself. So what I recommend as the first step is to ask yourself what your motivations are. Why do you want to reduce your lawn? And I am a crazy, obsessive, plant-loving gardener. It did all start with master gardener training. When I went to school, I learned a lot of plants. I learned about the native plant movement. There were things I had never heard of. People were telling me that this would grow around here. And I didn't really believe them until I tried it in my own yard. So I went through a period of experimentation. I needed a lot of room to experiment with all of these new plants. So therefore some of my lawn had to go. And that's how I began as a lawn reducer. However, from there, my motivations changed because I soon noticed that it was a delightful creative endeavor. And I managed to put together something that was beautiful and beauty begat joy and peace in the garden and in nature. And then my neighbors started to appreciate it. So it became a wonderful way of getting to know people and to perhaps interest some other people in gardening. So I am strongly motivated to have a beautiful garden. Yes, I am ecologically committed. Yes, I am supporting things that will bring in the birds, the butterflies and the bees, but I'm also motivated simply by beauty. And there I am in the photo as I spend a lot of time on my hands and knees. For me, this is a physical endeavor. Once you've identified your modifications, let's play the love it or lose it game. Since I decided to keep some, I wasn't just keeping it and letting it stay the way it was. I wanna know why I want it. So why did I want to keep some of my lawn? First, because as I went to school and learned about design, I do love the contrast of a fully planted wild looking area with the controlled monoculture of a beautiful stand of turf grass. So it contributes to aesthetics for me. Also, apparently Olmsted and Scott have had their way with me because I noticed that every house on my street has some lawn area. I like my neighbors. I want to fit in with my neighbors. So I want to have a little bit of lawn too. That's why I've kept some of it and I lost it for the usual reasons that I've just stated, ecological interest and more space to plant. Please do note that in our stories, these are not right answers. These are only my experiences and my answers. And the same is true of the other presenters. You may have other reasons for reducing your lawn. Maybe you want to put in more area for vegetable gardening. Maybe you're finally and at last ready to give up on trying to grow grass in deep shade. Maybe you have a slope that just seems dangerous to get out on your lawnmower on. So there are all kinds of reasons. And all lawn reduction is good lawn reduction, whatever your reasons may be. When I was a student, I took planting design class from Thomas Rayner. And Thomas taught us to begin our thinking with what he called a black and white study. This is part of the preliminary design process, conceptual design. And the idea is get a little map with your property lines and the location of your house, and then draw in all the places that you want to walk on or where you're going to do something. Leave those areas in white, then color everything else in black, and voila, the black area will be your planting area. The white area is going to be either hardscape or lawn. And let's... See if I can just kind of walk you through. There's my house. There's my driveway. It's a permeable driveway. The scale of the car tells you that I have a small yard. This is a typical Arlington one sixth acre. I've got a front walk that's made of stone, a walk there, and then I can go this way through a little pergola, go into a screened porch, 
walk here. This is the basement stairwell. It's a path. This funny looking thing here is a bird bath on a flagstone pad. There's my shed, more white area. So that's the black and white study of my lawn. Then um, how much of this is actually lawn? I colored it in green so you can see it. So in the front, you can see my lawn connects to the sidewalk so that the neighbors can see in a little bit, right? Um, I call this my front lawn. Arguably, I might call it a pathway that I use to walk around. And remember that one of the great virtues of turf grass is that it is walkable. Clearly a pathway through the side yard. This circular element, this is a very recent change. I've had lawn in a larger area here and I'm changing to this smaller area. Yes, it's true. Even today, I'm still reducing bit by bit. But what I have here is I wanted to do some grading, make it level. This is where I'll have uh, my little table and chairs. So I want to sit on some turf grass for that. Okay, so I want to give you a look at my garden. I'm not going to talk about it much and I'm just going to run you through a slideshow so that you can see what it looks like. I'm generally using fully planted areas with tree, shrub and uh, perennial and ground cover layers. So that's the alternative to turf that I'm using primarily. And I'm just going to let you see it. Okay, so hopefully you saw a few glimpses of lawn in there. Um, the design principles that have governed what I'm doing are the lawn really is a part of the garden. I, as a gardener, take a horticultural approach. So the way that I often put it when I'm talking to myself is that I have a lot of everything. I have a lot of native plants. I have a lot of benign non-native plants. I have a fair amount of herbs. I have a fair amount of annuals. So I love it all. And I do manage the placement and design of the plants in a highly constructed way, moving things around for a particular look. So that stands in contrast to another approach where the gardener might select a native plant community that's local to our area and use that as a reference point for a garden. So that's a, a more ecologically end of the continuum. But I love all the plants too much to restrict myself. So I do like a complex planting that's balanced by contracts and legibility. I like for someone's eye to be able to move through the garden and say, oh, yes, this is beautiful. I do take a lot of care to use cues of care so that my heavily planted areas are difficult for the eye and people will react negatively, sometimes thinking that that looks messy. Okay, and finally, a garden should be an immersive experience. This is also a concept of Thomas Rainer's. So I'm primarily immersed on my screen porch where I have some large shrubs that are just outside the pathway, but I have a couple of benches throughout as well so that I can sit in the areas that I've created and feel like I'm really in nature. Now, I do wanna talk a little bit about the lawn and it, it looms fairly large in my story because five years ago, when I was really gearing up with the planted areas and thinking about the lawn, when standards went up in the planted areas, standards also went up for the lawn. I'd always been the kind of gal who it's, you know, it's green, there's some weeds in it, but who cares? I mow it, it's green, I mow it, uh, it's okay. But then I decided I wanted to have a really top drawer lawn. And at that point, I had to decide, do I want to hire someone to take care of the lawn area? 
or do I want to do it myself? I thought, I'm a master gardener, I can do it myself. So if you do undertake this, the first thing that you need to do is some assessment of the lawn areas that you have and ask the question of how bad is it with regard to the weeds? My front and my back were very different. My front was in pretty good shape. My backyard was not so good. The next thing you have to do is understand the pests that you have in your lawn, that is the weeds. Um, remember that master gardeners run plant clinics. If you're going to learn what your weeds are, you can use cooperative extension resources. You can pull up a handful of it and take it over to a plant clinic. You can go to help desk. But it is crucial to know exactly what weeds you have because they have different treatment plans, surprisingly different at different times of the year. Lawn care is a completely different kind of horticultural activity from full plantings. It's a more intellectual and brainy kind of thing. So integrated pest management for turf, and do note that integrated pest management is recommended by cooperative extension for all gardening endeavors. I use integrated pest management in my planted beds. If you're growing vegetables, you should be using integrated pest management. It's used all over. It's not a lawn thing, in other words but it provides some strategies and some tips that if you're going to do your reduced lawn area yourself that you would want to be aware of. Cultural controls have to do with the right plant, right place idea. Your best defense against weeds is a nice, healthy stand of the desired turf grass. So cultural controls include things like starting with a soil test, using seed that are produced for your local area or sod that is most effective for your area. Mowing fescue high helps to shade out weeds, pursuing cooperative extension fertilization programs, et cetera, et cetera. Once it's pretty clean and pretty thick, you're pretty well positioned. Mechanical controls consist basically of digging, I do a lot of digging and there's one reason that I can do that. And that is that I have reduced my lawn to be small enough that I actually can dig up a few violets. If you have half an acre of lawn and it's full of violets, you're not going to be able to dig them up. That's not a strategy that will work very well for you. But because I have very limited areas, I am able to use mechanical controls pretty well. Biological controls, I didn't have a pest that that was pertinent to. Chemical controls, we want to keep as limited as possible. Some things in my lawn did require chemical control, but the name of the game there is, can you treat it and treat it once and don't treat it over and over again? Get rid of it. Um, do you have to treat the whole area or can you just spot treat? And this is a uh, helpful public service advertisement from Cooperative Extension. <laughs> If you're going to use chemicals at all, be very serious about all of those things that are on the screen. Those are all precautions that you must be very serious about. And you can take my word for it that it can be fairly easy to think, oh, it's awfully hot today. I don't want to put on my lawn pants, long sleeves, my face mask, and my nitrile gloves. So oh, I don't think it's very windy. No, no, no. All of this must be adhered to, to the letter. And if you don't think it's for you, then go with an entirely organic approach. So I do want to just tell you what happened with my lawn before I move on. So the front was pretty good when I started. I was able to get rid of my broadleaf weeds pretty easily. Some of it was harder, but over the five-year period that I had given myself, the front today in April, a good time of the year for a fescue lawn. My front yard looks great. My backyard became an absolute disaster. I made a mistake at the very beginning when I did the assessment. I knew that there was a much greater presence of a weedy grass called rough stock bluegrass. I knew it was there, but I indulged in hopefulness. And I thought to myself, perhaps it would be a cultural control to just let the fescue and the rough stock bluegrass coexist. They're both cool season grasses. The fescue is a clumper. The bluegrass was a runner. I thought maybe they'll play nicely together. Nothing I read in any cooperative extension resource would have led me to believe that was true. But I'm used to enjoying creativity and experimentation. <laughs> 
in the planting beds and I indulged myself in giving it a go. I did put in my resources, cooperative extension resource on rough stock bluegrass, just as an example of what a really good resource on a particular weed looks like. It's just an example, but all the things that are in there that said could have happened, happened to me. So I ended up with great big brown patches <laughs> and they would appear in the late summer. The bluegrass likes kind of cool and shady. I had it in full sun. I had grown weary of watering it. So I got the great big brown patches and then they were there through the summer. They were there through the winter, so ugly. And I thought, well, I'll try it again next year. Patience is a virtue. Same thing happened and even worse. You know, this time, instead of just going dormant, I, it actually died. So I am tomorrow, actually, having a landscape company come out and install some sod in that little circular area that I showed you. And that is an instant way to get to the promised land of a healthy patch of turf grass. That's my story. And what about maintenance? I do just want to make the point that lawn reduction and maintenance reduction is not the same thing. Because of my intensive approach to gardening, everything I do is pretty high maintenance. It's different maintenance which is interesting. In the garden, I weed, I prune, I divide things, I move things around, I make things look better. And that to me is a very joyful experience. It's, as they say, kind of a flow experience for the lawn. It's a, it's a different kind of thing. As I said, it's more figuring things out. It's more having a strict plan that you adhere to. You do all the steps at the right time right thing at the right time. And you don't dare deviate from that because if you don't get out and water when you should or um, you know, pull a weed when you should, it might get away from you. The planted areas are much more forgiving. Something that I don't get done in the spring can wait until the fall. And really no one but me is the wiser. So yes, maintenance. But after all, maintenance is gardening, right? And that's what we love. I have absolutely no regrets about anything that I've done, even the lawn care part, because I learned so much. I'm now in a position to ask good questions if I do hire a landscape service at some point. So it has all been good. And where do I go from here? All gardeners know that the garden is a continuously changing place. So where I am right now is not where I'm going to be 10 years from now. When I became a master gardener in 2010, there were three Norway maples and one Siberian elm in the backyard, all invasive trees. So I've removed all of those trees as part of the shift in the lawn reduction to multi-layered planting areas. But I now have half a dozen young native trees. They're small right now. I have a lot of sun, but they're going to get bigger. And when they start to cast a lot of shade, the cultural conditions in my yard will change dramatically. So that will be a driver of change. You have to wonder about fescue here. We're in the transition zone as it is, and it seems like things get hotter and drier every year. So will fescue continue to be a turf grass of choice? I don't know. And then there's me. I also am changing. I will be 65 on my next birthday. I'm pretty sure I can do all the labor when I'm 70 probably when I'm 80, but you know, I don't know. At some point, there's going to be a limit to what I can do. So all of this has changed, but it's an adventure. There are always surprises that are delightful, and I can't wait to see what will happen. There are the resources and credits. So there's Michael Pollan's book. Thomas Rayner and Claudia West book is a good read if you want to get into thinking about multi-layered planting as a lawn substitute. And then a couple of uh, cooperative extension links just for more learning or examples. And then the photo credits, the Olmstead came from the architect of the Capitol with permission to reproduce. And most of the photos were taken by me or my husband. So that's my story. Great, thank you so much for this first part of the presentation, Carolyn. We have a couple questions in the chat one is about how long did it take to create your garden? I mean, I know you mentioned that it's evolving and the question even recognizes that they're never fully done, but to get to a point, I guess, where you were happy with it while it continued to evolve, about how long did that take? That's an interesting question 
because I, it was a step-by-step -step process. So with every step, I made some improvement that I was happy with. There was never a crossover moment. I'm really happy with it now. And conversely, I always have a list of things that I want to do next. But I guess I could say that at the point that the trees came out, that opened up a lot of space. You know, and even as part of evolution, when one of the Norway maples that was in the very center of the yard came the first summer, it was really nothing I could plant there because of the roots. I mean, nothing in terms of the garden. So what I did was put some mulch and some compost on the top of it and put a lot of seeds for butternut squash out. So I had a great big old patch of butternut squash for a year while I was just covering ground. I wait for those stumps to decay. I have enjoyed seeing the fungus on them as they decay. <laughs> That's been one of the delightful surprises. I have a little fungus garden here <laughs> and it certainly is beautiful. And then too, when I plant things now, because the roots are decaying, I like to just kind of shove it right in there at one of those roots that's in the decay process. Because in the wild, if a tree falls, it's sometimes called a nurse log. So I think, oh, I've got a, this root's going to be a little nurse for this plant. So I'm just going to put it right there at the root and it will help to support this new plant. Gardening is a happy experience all the time. Sometimes it's more intense. It's, it's less intense now because I'm close to getting there. Well, I also remember you mentioned that you had given yourself a five-year uh, timeline for this. So maybe that's another good way to think about it too, is like a multi-year uh, timeline. Yeah, five years was for the lawn because okay. I knew that lawn care is not easy. And I thought, you know, if it's a struggle, in other words, if it produces more unhappiness than happiness, I'm not going to pursue it indefinitely. I'm going to set a time limit and give it up and do something else. There's been a whole dialogue in the chat box about lawn. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to compress them into like a multi-part question just in, for the sake of time. How did you actually remove your lawn? And then how would someone who has a particularly weedy lawn, it sounds like from the question that there are multiple weeds sort of in that lawn, how would you attack that? And then sort of your perspective on violets in a lawn or even violets <laughs> as a lawn. So I know that's a lot, but I'm just, I'm trying to, but they're all lawn related. So let me see if I can try to be fast with that. Violets are a very tough customer. And I had a few broadleaf weeds when I started. Those, almost all broadleaf weeds can be treated with a selective chemical treatment. And you find the right one that'll get the violets as well. I didn't have to do that for very long. At the beginning, I was trying to repair the lawn that I had. I wasn't at a point of replacing total take it out. Well, I am actually not going to say that. As I was chipping away and creating garden beds, like the one that's at the sidewalk, if it was a small area, I used the smother method. So I just leave the grass there and then I put down newspaper and I put six inches of mulch on top of it. And then I be patient, you know, and sometimes after a couple of months, I would just kind of dig a little hole and put a shrub in there without taking the paper or the mulch up. But then after a season or two, the paper has decayed, the mulch has started to incorporate itself into the soil. And I use leaf mulch, by the way, not wood mulch. And at that point, I could go ahead and fill in the planting more fully. So for smaller beds, I used smother. And that's a good way to go. I like doing that. For the backyard where I had the problem, and I've got the area where it's just so weedy, it's a little bit big to smother it. And because I've already invested five years, whether it's something to be proud of or not, I'm kind of interested in instant gratification. So in that case, I used Roundup and I killed all of it. It's dead. So I am well and truly uh, starting over with lawn in that area. And as I was saying, make a good assessment at the beginning. Don't do like I did. And if you really have a lot of weeds in a big area, ask yourself if you want to spend five years trying to make it work yourself or say, this looks a little bit more difficult. Um, Carolyn said she struggled with it. I think I'll just hire a professional and then ask them questions like, you know, how bad do you think it is? What are my main weeds? How do you recommend treating them? 
Can you see a pathway to organic lawn care? How long would that take? Are you going to differentiate treatments and just spot treat when you see a problem? Or do you have a program that you just apply to everything all the time, every time you come out or on some kind of a calendar schedule? So you can make a good decision when you hire someone by finding someone who does do organic methods, who can move you toward it, and who can make good differentiated decisions about care along the way. Thanks, Carolyn. We're going to move on to Alyssa's section just for the sake of time. I think some of these questions will still be coming up and some of them I think will be addressed as we move on through the presentation. So. I am so pleased to be here this morning. We put out a call to Master Gardeners about who has done lawn reduction, lawn replacement, and is willing to share their story. And these are some of the stories that we got. I'm going to be sharing four other Master Gardener stories first, and then at the end, share my own. So we're going to start here with Henry and Claudia's front yard, and I think they're on the call. So if people put in questions into the chat box, they may be able to answer directly. But this is a real fun one, in part because these homeowners had become really good friends and had a great relationship with their neighbors. The neighbors had let them know that they were really happy to have the lines of the boundaries of the properties blended on both sides, actually. And so they didn't have to worry about where one yard ended and another began. And in fact, in the backyard, they'd already done some blending of the yards. They wanted to incrementally be replacing their lawn with non-lawn plants. They wanted to have not a strictly formal kind of design. They wanted just enough structure, especially during winter, so that you could see that this was intentional. They wanted to look presentable, but not real fancy, not well manicured, or as my grandmother used to say, not nasty neat. One of their goals, and I love this one myself, was to encourage conversations with passersby. And a quote is, we wanted the plants to do their thing for the space to become alive with colors, butterflies, and bees. So let's take a close look. This is their list of plants of what they put into this half of the yard that they completely removed the lawn and planted into. So what went well, here we have a photo from the third year after they started this, and they were really pleased with the blooms and the color. And I think you can see there are all sorts of things in bloom, lots of beautiful colors. They were really pleased with all the tiny native bees that had become regular members of their yard population. They were having a lot of conversations with passersby. People would strike up a discussion, ask questions about what the plants were, that sort of thing. And they liked the fact that there was less rigor and more watching what the plants wanted to do and adapting to that. Some of the things that didn't go as they wanted were the fact that a few of the plants didn't make it. And I have a personal comment here. I find that almost every gardener has a few plants that just won't grow for them. It's really not a reflection of how good a gardener they are, or at least that's what I tell myself when I keep replanting particular plants and can't get them to grow well. I have a few that I have replanted many times in my backyard, and I'm not sure why it isn't working, but they just don't work. But sometimes that's what happens. Their hardscaping did not go in ahead of time, but they're really okay with the idea that if they decide that they want to add some more hard escaping, they can dig up these plants, move them around, and adapt things down the road. Plants are amazingly able to move around. Of course, the bigger the plant is, the trickier it is to do, and the more muscle it takes. But this is one of the things I feel like I have really come to understand as a master gardener. You can move most plants. 
they did want to add one small tree and they already had a red bud and a service berry, but they wanted something a little smaller that had some fall interest. And so they decided on a little witch hazel to go right into the front yard that has just enough structure as it fills out and they have these beautiful blossoms when they bloom. They gave us some great advice to pass along, go through the thinking process, plan the garden, think about what size and shape and location, think about how much sunlight, water, soil, and drainage. These are, these is, this is pretty standard advice, but it really pays to do that thinking. Do work on finding the right plant for the right place. Choose carefully what should work in your site. Particularly, I like to think about size. A lot of people think about the size of the plant when they buy the plant, not the size of the plant when it's three years, five years, 10 years down the road. That can make a big difference. Prepare the soil, and this is classic master gardener advice because we always advise doing a soil test, find out what your pH is and what the nutrients are, and that way you know if you need to make some changes. Most of Northern Virginia has fairly clay-like soil that's a little bit acid, but you know, when you test it out, I am always being surprised to find um, a bed or an area that doesn't fit what I expect. And it's worth knowing that in advance before you plant a bunch of plants that are not uh, suited for what you actually have. Do be patient. Gardens take time to mature and reach their potential. And it's really fun to watch them as they do what they're going to do. You'll be excited at every step of the way. Additional thoughts, and I really like some of these from Henry and Claudia. While hardscaping can provide some visual interest, it does not change with the seasons. And so really the more interesting part of your garden is the plants and you can focus on those. Front yards are sometimes the sunniest spots. And so if that is where you want to grow some edibles, that's probably a good idea, but you should probably check with your neighborhood rules first. Some neighborhoods are very strict on whether you can put vegetables in or not. Now, I happen to believe that so many vegetables are beautiful, so you can get away with a lot even if the rules say not to, but it's a good idea to check what's actually on the books. This is a really good point. It's true that you're probably going to see your front yard more than anybody else, but in total, other people will be seeing it more than you. And so I really like that idea of don't just plan from your house out, but plan from the street in. What's it going to look like to other people? Um, how will they be able to see in or not? Look around your neighborhood and see what's been done and what's missing, you can find your own niche. It's not that you can't duplicate what somebody else is doing. I mean, these guys actually are kind of spreading their plants across more than one yard. Um, and that probably looks really nice, but you can probably find something special to do in your own yard. And I, this one really makes me very happy. With so many grassy yards, the bar is really low for adding something more appealing. And I say amen to that. Certainly beautiful grass can look very nice, but I've seen it 5 billion times before. It's not gonna catch my eye. Watch and adapt. The plants will move um, and they will do what they want. Perennials are a lot of fun. They keep changing through the year and over the years. The plant you put in is going to be very different the first year than the third or fourth or fifth year. And that is it for Henry and Claudia's yard. And we're going to move on to Scarlett's yard. Scarlett was rebuilding, essentially creating an all new home. This is an in progress of the house build and you can see across the front there's this very steep grassy area. Now 
as she is explained, and I don't know that you can see it really well in this picture, but it had grass, it also had some ivy in there, it had some other things. It was very difficult to mow. In fact, it was too steep to use an actual mower. They had to use a weed whacker to mow. So when they got done with the house, they decided that they did not want to keep the front the way that it had been. This was back in 2017. They originally thought that they would do just a big retaining wall, but uh, they went ahead and consulted with a landscape designer who really said, no, you could do something really beautiful that's plant-based. And so they put together a palette of drought tolerant, hardy plants, and we'll refer to this several times. They ended up adding some very large rocks a little bit later on. So the process as it went, they did hire some professionals to install the shrubs, which are often a little trickier and digging holes on a slope is really hard to do. But they installed their own perennials and ornamental grasses. I don't believe that they did a great deal of trying to kill what was already there. Instead, they simply removed it as they planted new stuff and, in fact, have continued removing the grass and ivy for a very long time. They keep trying new plants because some plants do really well and some don't. And often as the garden grows, you find, oh, there's a spot where I could sneak in another plant, which they keep doing. The erosion was an ongoing issue. And so three and a half years after they started this project, they did hire a team to come and professionally install landscape stones that would help with the erosion. And apparently it has done a really good job. We'll see some more pictures of those. And in fact, here you can see some of the stones that have been put into this bank. This is the list of plants that they have used. I do want to point out that one of the things I was really pleased about in this plant list was that there right in the middle is the juniper, which so often I have seen on slopes, and it does work on slopes quite well, but I usually don't like it because there's just too much of it. And it's the only thing on the slope. Whereas here mixed in with other plants, I think it's really pretty. And in fact, you can see that juniper here in this shot and here in this shot. So things that went well, the addition of the stones and the landscaping boulders did solve a lot of problems that they really didn't realize that they had at the beginning. You can see that they ended up putting stones at the bottom border here, which has really helped as well as some of these larger stones. They feel like it's really beautiful in the spring and that it has lots of blooms. It's a lot lower maintenance than working on that steep grassy slope. While they do have to maintain it, Scarlett said that it's really two, maybe three times a year that she spends a number of hours going through and weeding and putting in a few new plants as needed, which is quite a different thing and more at her control under her uh, schedule rather than having to mow on a routine basis. She really thinks that working with the landscape architect resulted in a really nice looking planting area, which I agree, I think it's quite lovely. Erosion was a challenge at first. This was one of the things that didn't go as well as they had hoped, but as we've already mentioned, the stones really helped a lot. And some of the original plants did not do as well as they wanted. One that she particularly wasn't wild about was the sedum ceramentosum, which had already been there along with the grass and the ivy, and it just started spreading everywhere. And now she's removing it kind of continually. Uh, eventually, she thinks she'll get rid of all of it. Since there is no irrigation on this slope, it is definitely an issue that she had to hand water as the plants were establishing. And I think she's done a little bit of soaker hoses through there also. But once they're established, these plants seem to be doing really well. Her takeaways, um, <laughs> as she says, if you've got a steep slope, look at putting in boulders first. And she really recommends working with a professional to get 
the right plants. And she really felt like that was a great investment of money. Okay, we're going to go on to Nancy's front yard. And this one is a really nice example of something that I think can work for just about anyone. Basically, Nancy has had four young trees put into her yard several years ago. And what she's doing is that every year, she progressively widens those tree circles by 12 inches so that the beds are becoming increasingly larger. She does that widening using either cut sod, I'll show you a picture of that, or 12 inch layers of wood chips and just lays them down and lets them decompose, or sometimes has used some reclaimed soil. And I believe once she tried some lasagna beds, but apparently what she's really finding works well is the 12 inch layers of wood chips that you just lay down. And a year later, they've broken down well enough that you can plant into them. Then she adds layers of plants, shrubs, perennials, ground covers, in addition to the young trees. She's been using golden ragwort, which is well known as one of our native ground covers that I call the silver bullet because it takes all kinds of conditions. It takes sun, it takes shade, it takes wet or dry. It's a really hardy ground cover that can really outcompete invasives. She's also been creating beds by the fence, removing English ivy, smothering it with wood chips, and planting Virginia creeper along her fence line. What's gone well about that, she had had a lot of problems in her yard with flooding. Every time there'd be a heavy rain, there'd be a lot of standing water, but the trees and the wood chips have really helped to reduce that. The plants have done really well. She's popped in some bulbs and then used some river birch twigs to mark the bulbs. And here, this small inset picture is those river birch twigs, and they're sprouting, and she's not sure what she's going to do about those sprouted river birch twigs, but I know she'll come up with a good answer. She's really pleased with how the wood chips are decomposing in a year. The trees are all doing really well. She feels like she gets a lot of stormwater runoff from the neighboring large houses that have been put in recently. And instead of creating an ongoing problem, it seems to stop at her yard and be able to be absorbed. She's really enjoyed the fact that the neighbors have responded well. And in fact, she's apparently shared a lot of golden ragwort with them. And the neighbors are copying her technique. So she's being a good missionary explaining how to reduce your lawn very easily in an incremental manner. The challenges have been that those wood chips are heavy and moving them can be a lot of work. And if you hire someone to help, it can cost a fair amount of money. Here is what she did rather creatively when a new sidewalk went in on the edge of her property and they had to dig up some sod. She had the workers bring those pieces of sod and put them upside down around the tree circle. And that is now breaking down to become a larger bed. She started with several goals. She wanted to reduce the lawn. She wanted to help with the water issues, but she didn't really have a design plan. She wasn't quite sure where she was going. The work was fairly hard. Her advice that she gives now um, as I start this sweet little video of the goldfinches that have come into her garden, her advice is that it's really fun to interact with the neighbors and share the plants. She uses some cues of care, such as the signage that explains that she's trying to make her yard more environmentally friendly and keeps the yard looking nice so nobody thinks that it's just going wild. She says the neighbors don't mind the lawn reduction because the expanded beds look really deliberate. She was really pleased with Echo Action Arlington that supplied and planted three of the four trees. And I have to say, they're really terrific. They bring in great trees and plant them really professionally, and you end up having a great tree in your yard. She does think it's a good idea to have a plan for what you want to accomplish, but you can learn as you go and you can start small, which I think is a really important takeaway. On to our fourth case study before we get to my personal yard 
is another Nancy. And this is a yard that I have been privileged to spend some time in. It's a very heavily sloped front yard with a walkway up to the house going up the center. And there was lawn on both sides, not huge amounts of lawn, small amounts of lawn, but even at that, they wanted to reduce the traditional lawn and replace it with a no mow alternative. This is not the kind of lawn that you have to mow more than once or twice as it's establishing. They do have a different look. They have a more wispy, delicate look and sometimes slightly floppy because they don't get mown and so they're not shaven off at the precise few inches height. So their, their process was that they covered all their existing lawn with tarps from October to March. I saw those tarps, they were heavy tarps and between the sun hitting them and the lack of light getting through, the lawn underneath was then killed. They roughed up the ground, they added humus and then sowed some no-mo seed from Prairie Nursery and put it down. The weather in March when they put the seed down was absolutely perfect for germination. They got great germination and initially they were thrilled with what they got. It looked exactly like what they were hoping for. But as time went on, they left for several months and when they came back, they found that the lawn was very spotty. It had not really covered the way that they wanted and there were a lot of weeds. And so Nancy had to very laboriously spend a lot of time in the fall digging out weeds. They took the time to reseed with the same NOMO mix that fall. And unfortunately, after the receding, while it did look better, they still were not happy with the way that it looked. There was still spotty coverage, but even more problematic were prevalent weeds. And so this is a case where they decided that they weren't going to continue this effort. And on the one side, they gave up they decided that they would overseed with regular grass seed. And that's these um, top picture here, the circular part of the lawn. And as you see lower down on the slope along their driveway, a narrow area of grass that they have. On the other side, they simply replaced the lawn. They didn't have lawn at all. They decided to plant natives and perennials and have no more grass on that side. So they did reduce the amount of lawn that they had. One thing that they learned was that what they had not really seen before, and, and we think that maybe it's just become more readily available, the information about no mow lawns, is that where you do this makes a big difference. It's really something more recommended for the northern states. Virginia is a borderline. It's definitely not recommended in the south. So if you want to know, does no mow lawn work here in Virginia, you've got at least one person, one example here, where they felt it did not work. And we are to a point where we want to take some questions. We have a few questions here. One of them is about blue-eyed grass as an alternative. I think it was one of the examples shown in Scarlett's front lawn, I think. But if you could speak a little bit more about that as a lawn alternative. Blue-eyed grass is a lovely native plant. It's actually in the iris family. It has kind of a grassy look. It does not grow particularly tall. I've never seen it taller than five or six inches tall. And as the name implies, it gets these pretty kind of bluey purple flowers. I have never heard that blue-eyed grass can take much in the way of foot traffic. So if you want to create an area that looks like lawn, but that you're not going to walk on, I think it would be a good replacement. If you want something that you're going to walk on, I would say it's not a great replacement. What about carex and meadow-like plants that can be mowed at the end of the year? Wonderful. Um, carex, I actually have as a reference, 
at the end of this show, the link to the Mount Cuba Center Carrick's report that they just came out with a couple months ago and bless their hearts. I love Mount Cuba. If you're not familiar with them, it's a beautiful garden to visit. They specialize in natives and they test native plants and they grow out for three to five years, different kinds of plants. And they have just come out with their report on how it went with carexes, which are sedges, are native sedges. And some of them that they thought might be, work as lawn replacement, they actually mowed and they gave the report on how well they do. I have not tried any of these myself. I may try adding in some of the shadier parts of my lawn area, some of these carexes. The thing about carexes is that they're mostly for shade. So they might be a great thing to try if you have a shady area that you want to use a lawn replacement. Unfortunately, this presentation, I didn't find anybody who had tried doing that. So I cannot give any you know, personal examples as to whether it works or not. And you said carex and something else? Carex and meadow-like plants. So it wasn't a specific plant, but meadow-like plants. Meadow-like plants. Okay. And I'm not, that's kind of a big category because meadows can have all sorts of plants, but I assume that they mean native grasses. My next presentation does include one of our native grasses that I used in my own. So we can come back to that. The trick is that very few of our locally native grasses seem to be really short. And so while I have heard people say, oh, you could try little blue stem. To me, little blue stem can grow really tall and I don't think it would respond well to being whacked off short. So again, it might work if you're not wanting to walk on it. But the one that I used, I think shows great promise as a native meadow type grass that you could use. One question was just about zoysia grass and whether that was a good option for here. And then another was about removing Bermuda grass. Honestly, neither of these are things that I'm a specialist in. I'm certainly willing to do a little research and I will try to find something and post something online. And here is my front yard. You can see this was a huge hideous lawn. When we bought this house, it was just a great big lawn. And what is hard to really tell from these photos is how dramatically the yard slopes from high in the closest to the house on the right to low on the left away from the house. So it slopes diagonally. And it was a pain to mow. It was never a great lawn to start with. My husband hated it. He wanted to give the mower away. And we finally were able to undertake a project where we were able to give away the mower, which I think was one of my husband's happiest days ever. What we decided to do was because of this slope and because we wanted some hardscape, I did not feel that I could handle this without some professional help. And fortunately, I was acquainted with Linda Carney, who I believe is on this call. She's a master gardener, that's how I knew her, but she is also a professional landscape designer. And so I brought Linda in to get her help and she made a marvelous design that I have been very, very happy with ever since. The idea was that most of the yard would become a layered mix of plants. There was already one fringe tree and one red bud on site, so we kept those. I had had some smaller perennials planted close to the house, which we dug up and potted for the duration of the work being done on the house. But for the most part, it was going to be brand new plants. I was going for the goal. I'm very concerned that I want to be ecologically friendly. And so I was wanting the goal of a minimum of 70% native biomass, which leaves the option of up to 30% of non-native biomass that is also not invasive. While we wanted to get rid of the lawn, I felt that we needed a little bit of lawn-like look to not look too weird in the neighborhood. Plus, the fact is that lawn is very helpful for getting through your garden. 
What Linda came up with was a lawn-like walkway that would give a path through the garden. And she said, let's have it imitate a stream just like the very nearby four mile run stream, which is at the bottom of our street. So we have this sinuous walkway coming through. This is the plan that we were working off of at the time. She since came up with this very lovely looking plan, which I quite treasure. Our hardscape work started in February of 2020. We had no idea that COVID was about to hit, but we could not have asked for a better COVID project. The yard had to be regraded. It doesn't really look like a lot of regrading, but it was quite important in order to make sure that the water went away from the house instead of going into the house. And you can see that we had a bobcat sitting on the lawn for nearly a whole month. It also happened to be a very, very wet February that year. By the time the bobcat left, most of the lawn had been destroyed by the regraining, which was great because then I didn't have to worry about what to do with it. It had been turned under or whatever. And of course, you can see that there was some conditioner put on top of it. For the rest of the lawn, and there was quite a bit to the left side here, we ended up doing a few different things. For one thing, we were planting it heavily with plants. So that was getting rid of the lawn. Um, in some places, we put down some paper with leaf mulch over it just in order to encourage that lawn to die really fast. And in the steepest parts, we put paper and then a jute mat in order to hold the mulch and the plants on that steep slope. The jute has since decomposed as we expected, as the paper did very, very quickly, but it did serve the purpose of keeping things from washing away as we were working. I'm gonna start this video. I hope it's not too distracting. I did not film it for the purpose of this presentation. I filmed it to show my family and. California as it was going, but it does show what we were doing. We used metal bender boards to edge the new walkway. We had had quite a bit of debate and I came out um, happily at this point, I admit I was wrong. I was lobbying for no bender boards and just doing a trench that we would fill with the rocks that I knew were so prevalent on our property, but I got talked into putting some metal, metal bender boards in that we got just from Home Depot. And the rocks that, again, I know my yard, and every time I put a spade into the ground, I will hit a rock. And so we simply decided that we would put the rocks on the outside edge of the bender board, not so much because we thought it would look pretty, but just to have a place to put them. I figured with time, they would kind of get covered up and indeed they have, you'll see in further photos. So that all was happening in March of 2020. I thought long and hard and discussed with a lot of people and came up with what I decided I wanted. I wanted to use a base or a backbone of micro clover. Micro clover is a cultivar of white clover that for one thing does not bloom nearly as much as white clover. In fact, it pretty much never blooms and it is designed to grow very short. Now you have to whack it down a few times in order to sort of train it that it should be short, but I have found that I can do that quite easily with a weed whacker. As I said, we did give away our lawnmower. It keeps a lower form than white clover. I wanted to overplant that with Danthonia spicata, poverty oak grass, which is a wonderful native grass that the more I become acquainted with poverty oak grass, the more places I see it. After I started using it in my own lawn over at the Glen Carlin Library Demonstration Garden, where we have a large historic cemetery kind of in the middle, I looked down suddenly in this cemetery area where I'd been many, many times and suddenly realized this is poverty oak grass. And I realized it really does make quite a nice lawn kind of area. It can take mowing. And it is a little browner than most green mixtures of lawn that we're used to. But I felt like combined with the micro clover, it would look nice. 
I wanted to then because <laughs> I could not restrain myself. I found that there was a mixture of wildflowers that is meant to be used in lawns. And so I sowed some of that into the mix. Then I really wanted my violets to come back up. And I wasn't sure how much the regrading would have hurt the violets or not. But my husband and I both love them. We love the fact that they support for Larry the butterflies. We think they're beautiful. So we hope that they would come back. And I put creeping thyme along the stepping stones. I've seen that used, interestingly enough, in Nancy's yard, the presentation that I made just before. She has some thyme in her backyard that I just love mixed with the stones. And lastly, because I cannot help myself, I wanted to plant some bulbs and some spring beauty along the edges. I thought it would be really pretty to have blooming things in spring. And I'm still hoping that my spring beauty spreads itself into colonies. I found a neighbor who had a huge colony of spring beauties and I approached her and she was really kind enough to gift me with some of her spring beauty, which has indeed come back very nicely and some is in bloom right now. So how I started was we put down heavy leaf mulch on both the beds and the paths. I was planting all my plants in the beds. And so I was using the path all the time. And I was really worried that I would step on new seeds and make them not want to come up. And so I made the decision that I would start planting just the edges of the pathway, as you can see here. And I put in both some small plants. I got some Danthonia spicata, half dozen plants from Earthsonga so that I would have something mature. I really didn't know how well it would do from actual seed. And then the thyme plants I was just buying from nurseries and I was trying all sorts of different creeping thyme. I was highly influenced by a book I read as a child called The Thyme Garden that had all sorts of thyme growing in it. And then I also put down seeds, and this is how it looked. The white clover is pelleted. Currently, the seed is really tiny, so tiny that it's actually hard to spread. And so they actually put a coating on it. And this particular company that I was using at first put a hot pink coating on it. So you can see that. And the longer seeds are the Danthonia spicata seeds. Now, unfortunately, it's much harder to get Danthonia spicata seeds and they're much more expensive and I ran out during the planting. So most of the Danthonia spicata seeds went in along the edges and not in the middle because I ran out by the time I went to the middle. So this is just how it looks as, as it was growing. You can see the parts that had been seeded first along the edge are this nice bright green and the new newly sprouted seeds are sort of a darker green. And here it is as it's growing. And you can see that clover was really filling out. The Danthonia spicata was much slower to emerge. And we had a bunny move in and start eating the clover. Uh, and by fall of that first year, the micro clover had really pretty much filled in. And this is what it was looking like at one year. So the things that went right about this project, I love the Danthonia spicata, the poverty oak grass. As you can see, as the blades dry, they curl up. And I don't know what it is, but I just think it's super cute. It's really hardy. It seems once it's established, it is unfazed by anything you do to it. The bender boards have really been great. They've been helpful because anything that I feel like should be in the lawn area, if it comes outside the bender board, I just pull it out. And it really has helped to keep an edge. The micro clover is a really pretty green in summer and I don't have to whack it down very much. 
And that business with the rabbit, it really works well because it turns out that the rabbits, while we have had apparently a whole family of rabbits living in our yard, they almost entirely stay away from all the other plants because they really like the clover. Apparently they also really like liatris. I did lose a few liatris in the beds, but mostly the clover is a great way to accommodate the bunnies. And here's the good news, the violets have totally come back, both in the lawn and in the regular beds. This photo down here on the right is just about two weeks ago. And again, we've got this beautiful purple added to our green and we really like it. So I'm so happy it's there. Things I did not anticipate, partly because of all the mulch that we used, we started getting a whole lot of mushrooms. Uh, there was a period of several weeks where every morning there would be literally thousands of mushrooms in the morning. And by 11 o'clock, they would have literally melted to a little spot of black inky type of substance. We got other mushrooms. Um, I happen to enjoy mushrooms. My last name is Morel, so I always think they're fun, but some people would probably be bothered by that. I didn't anticipate that the clover, which I had started so close to the edge, would try to climb over the bender boards. And especially where the bender boards meet, it can kind of go through there. I didn't anticipate how much it can die back in the winter and look kind of ratty. I'm really dealing with that this spring. I am over sowing. Uh, some new clover seeds. This year I've really found that there have been a number of winter weeds. Now I enjoy weeding so it's not that big of a problem for me but I wish there were less weeds. I didn't understand how difficult it would be to distinguish weeds from the flowering mix that I put down. Mostly because that mix had a bunch of different plants in it. And I just didn't know what they looked like as they came up. So I didn't know if it was a weed or not. So I probably left more weeds than I should have. I had no idea that we had a huge infestation of Star of Bethlehem, which when it was in our lawn, had just looked like grass because we mowed it down and it never got to bloom. I am dealing with that now. It is incredibly difficult to get rid of. It is a nasty invasive. Things I would do differently if I knew then what I knew, know now, I would have worked harder to get more Danthonia spicata and started with more of that from the beginning because I really love it. I would not have planted the microclover so close to the edge. It will spread. I didn't need to have it near the edge. I could have let it just grow to the edge. I would not have used that flowering seed mixture. I would choose a few flowering plants that I can recognize, um, maybe some sweet alyssum. Again, my name is Alyssa, so I always like to have some sweet alyssum around, and maybe some Johnny jump ups that I would have seeded in, and I can recognize those, and I wouldn't have confused them with weeds. And that's it. I've got resources here for you. Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website, mgmv.org, has three great videos that you can watch uh, that relate to lawn. One of them is short, the Climate Conscious Gardening Lawns, and the other two are full-length presentations. If you want help with local landscaping specialists, I highly recommend you go to the Plant Nova Natives website where they have professionals who work with natives. If you are not familiar with Douglas Tallamy's Homegrown National Park, that's a great website, and this is where he's really trying to get people to trade in their lawns and make their yards more environmentally friendly. Audubon at Home, I am an Audubon at Home ambassador, and I have to say it's a great program because it brings a volunteer to your yard to discuss all sorts of wonderful environmental practices and things that you can do in your own yard. And as I referenced earlier, the Mount Cuba Center Carex Trials. Take a look at that and other of their trials. They do this work and they make the information available absolutely for free. So I highly recommend that. So that is the end of my presentation. What questions do we have? One person asked, where did you get the micro clover seeds? If you're able to just answer that. Oh, um, <laughs> sure. In truth, I cannot remember the name of the company. I've got it from several 
different places. If you Google microclover, you'll find several companies that carry it. It comes often by weight. So you can get a quarter pound, a half pound. I think I initially got two pounds um, for my area. Thank you everyone for joining us this Friday morning. Just a reminder that this class will be available online in about two weeks at mgnb.org and you will also be able to see our upcoming class schedule there. So thanks again to Alyssa and Carolyn for sharing and for our other master gardeners who allowed their gardens to be shared in the presentation. Thanks everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.